Hello and welcome to the next session in the Building Embedded Control Systems webcast series. My name is Robert Hoffman. I am the Product Manager for SignalX Technologies. And today we're going to talk about how to implement distributed control. Before we begin, I'd like to just say a few words about SignalX. We are a National Instruments Gold Alliance partner based out of the Metro Detroit area in Michigan. We do have the embedded control specialty, which basically means that we are experts in control system design, specifically using the LabVIEW and NI Rio architecture that we're going to cover today. We have 15 employees, three certified LabVIEW architects, of which I am one, and the map at the lower part of the screen just shows some representative locations where we have uh, production test or manufacturing installations, uh, some of which use the LabVIEW real architecture for control or data acquisition. Before we begin talking about how to implement distributed control, it helps to talk about why you might need it in the first place. The three graphics at the lower part of the screen indicate that oftentimes the choice of whether or not to use distributed control is made by the environment that we're trying to control. The wind farm, the desert, the power plant, they all represent the fact that sometimes cabling, the environment, noise, or need for scalability can uh, drive us to use distributed control. So if we are trying to stretch over miles of a uh, potential control system and we don't want to run uh, potentially miles of instrument cable, instrument grade cable that can be very expensive and hard to maintain, we want to replace that with a single digital transmission cable and therefore putting the control system closer to the device for both cost and environmental reasons. That can be a clear reason for distributed control. When you do that, uh, when you replace the analog transmission uh, with a digital transmission over a single line, you do gain a significant amount of noise immunity and uh, you also can gain a significant amount of scalability so that you can protect for future expansion always happens uh, in that always happens in projects like this so once you've decided to use distributed control there are certain requirements that are going to drive hardware and software choices let's cover the hardware first so if you look at some of these uh, particular requirement areas, so speed, type of data, physical topology, they can be thought of as questions that you can ask yourself as you're designing your system. Do I measure my control loop rates in microseconds, milliseconds, or seconds? If I am trying to span a wind farm, I'm going to be spanning potentially miles of, uh, of uh, the physical region that I'm trying to stretch over my distributed control system. So do I measure my physical topology in inches, feet, or miles? Is my control system very complex so that I'm transmitting significant amounts of data combined with the maybe a high speed requirement? Or you, you might be transmitting sim significant bandwidth and that could drive uh, much of your hardware choice. Finally, you need to ask yourself, what is the cost of failure? So how mission critical is your application? Uh, and uh, this can often drive maybe not necessarily frontline hardware, but topology choices that uh, can introduce the right amount of redundancy or fail-safe operation in your system. Those hardware requirements often lead to various choices that you have to make. Uh, <clears throat> about both uh, the sort of uh, hardware that you're going to implement as well as the network topology that you're going to put in place. So how deterministic does your network need to be? A lot of times this comes down to how synchronized are the various nodes going to be need to be uh, in your system. Do each Does each node talk to each other and therefore needs to share a common clock? Or uh, is your control system relatively independent so that you maybe don't need to have a high level of synchronization between the nodes on the network? If you're stretching over miles and uh, you don't want to put in place a large sort of signal booster network, 
uh, then you might choose to go with a serial based uh, approach uh, versus uh, some sort of an Ethernet protocol. Obviously Ethernet is uh, virtually ubiquitous in, in our everyday life at this point, but it still does have its drawbacks. Uh, serial protocol, obviously a lot slower than an Ethernet, much older, but it does uh, support longer transmit lines uh, without the need for any sort of boost in the middle. That mission critical uh, application uh, often drives a significant amount of network topology choices. So, uh, and this primarily comes down to uh, how does my network fail if one node or one connection drops off? So, uh, are all my nodes connected to a central location and therefore if that location fails, my entire control system goes down? Or do I have a level of redundancy in the network that allows one section of the network to drop off perhaps even recovering all the way to all the nodes. And then uh, obviously today Wi-Fi is uh, everywhere we go, but oftentimes Wi-Fi is probably not an appropriate choice for a distributed control system. However, it is something to think about, particularly if you have the need for uh, devices that drop on and off the network to monitor uh, what's going on or simply the physical infrastructure doesn't allow uh, the addition of a wired connection. So once you come up with those choices, we have to make some other decisions about where to uh, implement the distributed control. So in order to evaluate those decisions, it helps to understand the LabVIEW Rio architecture. I have here a picture of a just standard compact Rio. The Compact Rio is made up of three main parts. The FPGA uh, backplane is uh, connected to C-series modules, and those modules serve as your sensor inputs and actuator outputs. The uh, FPGA is capable of high-speed control, so this is sort of at the microsecond level, uh, and as well as custom I.O., timing, triggering. Uh, many different capabilities at a very high speed with a high level of determinism. It typically talks over a high speed bus to a real time processor when you have an integrated system. That real time processor is also capable of control, maybe at the millisecond level. It's also capable of level of determinism and uh, it brings with an additional capability of uh, much more sophisticated analysis uh, connectivity over networks and control. Generally those uh, the real-time processor talks to some sort of networked uh, application, a, a PC, uh, another real-time processor that serves as a central data collector. So the primary choice that you have to make when you're talking about distributed control is where do I break that link and what is my expansion method. So am I going to have an FPGA distributed node or that is uh, highly deterministic but um, relatively simplified or am I going to embed a full-fledged real-time processor out at each node. So in order to kind of evaluate that decision let's look at each one of those levels. So if we take the FPGA expansion chassis first you have a couple of different choices Ethernet Rio, EtherCAT Rio and Mixi Rio expansion. Each one of these comes with a different set of pros and cons, but they all enable high-speed control and a high-level determinism back to a central, uh, central or distributed network. So Ethernet Rio sounds just like it is uh, in that it is a Ethernet expansion of an FPGA. So uh, a real-time or a Windows uh, application can talk to that expansion chassis basically uh, enabling that high-speed FPGA to talk over a long distance to the uh, centralized processor. It's very high speed. It allows that high-level determinism at the FPGA, but it's not deterministic communication up to the host. EtherCAT Rio, on the other hand, does allow for that level of determinism, especially among nodes. So if you need a high level of synchronization, among your control loops in your distributed architecture, either Cat Rio is probably the way to go, uh, but you do give up uh, data throughput uh, in order to achieve that. 
Mixi Rio, on the other hand, is very high speed, uh, much higher speed than Ethernet Rio, uh, but uh, you do sacrifice uh, um, length and distance that you can cover in order to achieve that. Moving up a notch uh, to uh, where you would put a full-fledged compact Rio out at your expansion uh, nodes, uh, obviously you get uh, many more options when you uh, put that more sophisticated processor out at each node, but you do get also an elevation in complexity. So the RT chassis can talk to each other and to a centralized host over Ethernet, some custom protocol. Uh, <clears throat> you can also do uh, many of the integrated chassis include a, a native RS-485 connection for multi-drop serial. Uh, and then also OPC UA becomes an option. Uh, this is a relatively new protocol, industrial standard protocol based on the Ethernet physical layer uh, that uh, can enable device to device communications. <clears throat> All of these uh, certainly do come with certain limitations. Uh, um, if, uh, for instance, you need to span a very large distance, you might be talking about synchronization of many different control nodes over a very wide range of distances and you might be talking about GPS time synchronization or IEEE 1588 synchronization. In this case you do it's less about the communication between the nodes than it is the synchronization of control actions. So all of these are options for you with the Compact Rio architecture. And uh, once you've made your hardware choices, it's important to think about the software. So let's just get into some of the software architecture. And I'm really, really only going to hit uh, two main points here. So and they're, they're the, the two most important things to think about when you design your software architecture for a distributed control system. So the first one is uh, design in layers. Um, this is just a simple way of saying make your software architecture modular, modular, which is a good programming practice regardless of if you are putting together a distributed control system or not. And uh, all I'm really trying to get at is, in particular for a distributed control system, you want to make each layer of that uh, no working down the, the tree of your nodes somewhat independent so that they can each operate without the other. And I've kind of laid out uh, the way that I would typically do this um, in that I've broken this down into three sections. View, decide, and control. Viewing is typically the responsibility of a PC application, something that's uh, not necessarily high reliability, and so you don't want to do any control at that level. You simply want to view and configure what's going on. Deciding is a sort of a logical... Uh, evaluation of what's going on typically done by a relatively smart processing unit like an RT controller and then ultimately uh, the control typically would reside down at the FPGA level where uh, it is got that sort of ultimate level of determinism and speed if you need it. The second thing to think about is you simply just have to plan on network outages. So the first thing you do when you sit down to design your distributed control architecture is to think about what happens when the network fails. First off, how are you going to know if the network fails? And then how are you going to recover from that when it comes back online? So typically this involves some sort of watchdog between the layers uh, of uh, your nodes uh, or between nodes in your network. <clears throat> when that watchdog fails, you go into some sort of a safe operation where you can maintain your safe states, and then you continue to watch for the network coming back online, and you go through a safe recovery. Again, just good architecture, good programming practice to uh, implement these kind of watchdogs while you're programming. So to illustrate some of these concepts, both in hardware and software, just talk to you about a case study of a control system that we built uh, for a biorefinery that converts biomass like wood chips into diesel fuel. This was a highly distributed control system and uh, we sort of took on this um, FPGA expansion chassis where you, we had two PXI controllers that run the entire process 
and they talked to a total of 10 EtherCAT chassis where the PID control was maintained. There were over 3,000 points of I.O. and uh, this was quite a large system and uh, obviously very uh, mission critical and safety critical. So if we look at how the architecture played out uh, in this system, you can see here the three levels that we talked about, view, decide, and control. Viewing was done by a standard Windows PC running in the control room. It was the primary operator interface and it was how the operators configured the system. The system itself was based on primarily the two PXI controllers running LabVIEW real-time. This was the primary logic engine behind the behavior and the operation of the refinery. They ultimately fed set points down to the EtherCAT chassis over the network um, and the chassis were responsible for maintaining that PID control. <coughs> so if one of those links were severed, then the system would recover and, uh, and be able to be managed on its own. For instance, if the PC dropped off, hard drive crashed, Windows didn't update and crashed on you, um, you lost the capability to view what was happening at the plant, which is kind of scary, but the plant still ran because all of the decision making was happening at the RT level. Alternatively, if uh, something happened to one of your EtherCAT chassis and you uh, lost that part of the network, the RT side would immediately flag that as a watchdog failure and start to sh shut the plant down and bring everything to a safe state. If the PXI dropped off, meaning you lost all sort of logical control of the operation of the refinery as a whole, the EtherCAT chassis, because all the PID control was happening on board there, maintained their current set point. So things didn't go completely awry. You were able to maintain your current set points as they last were. And then ultimately when the PXI came back online, uh, it uh, seamlessly uh, reconnected back up over your EtherCAT and got it running again. So that's just how that played out, and uh, this was a successful system we commissioned uh, about a year and a half to two years ago, and uh, this certainly is a good example of the uh, expansion architecture that's available through National Instruments and the Rio platform. With that, I'm going to conclude by thanking you for your time. Feel free to learn more about SignalX technologies at ni.com slash SignalX and uh, contact us if you have any questions. Thank you.